like to tell you a bit more about our charity conference. So uh, Air Helps Ukraine is a charity conference uh, where we bring together the leading air experts to present the recent advances of their research. And we're also raising funds to, uh, to support Ukraine with humanitarian aid. The uh, schedule of uh, our uh, conference is the following. We have uh, online talks during this month until early December. And uh, in the 8th of December, we'll have the in-person event uh, at, at Mila in Montreal. You're very welcome to register at our website. You can register to the online talk series. And uh, after that, we will send you a link to register for the offline event uh, when we open the registration. And I want to pay your attention that uh, registration to all our events is free because we believe that uh, knowledge should be accessible to everyone. But we uh, are very much asking you to support our mission with the nation because uh, unfortunately the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. And uh, right now many people there uh, live in the destroyed areas, especially in the eastern part of the country. And they are in need of basic things like food, uh, warm clothes, shelters, and they also uh, very need medications and uh, some expensive devices. For example, uh, right now, right now this device is at very high demand. It is a negative pressure wound therapy, uh, which is uh, very needed for wounds which people can get from uh, missiles. And unfortunately, that's a very common situation these days in Ukraine. People can occasionally encounter missiles in the ground or they can just come to close to their houses. And these devices uh, are very helpful for treating this kind of injuries. And without this device, uh, the treatment is much more harder and the consequences of the injury can be much more negative. And devices are very expensive. Uh, one device costs about two and a half thousand Canadian dollars uh, and we already uh, collected one and a half thousand dollars so we need uh, one thousand more and we are kindly asking you to support us with uh, with this goal so please go to our website uh, donate and it really helps us to save lives it's not just a catchy phrase that's our reality but uh, we can change it we can support people and help them to overcome this uh, very hard time and thanks a lot to our uh, partners, uh, Mila, who uh, kindly supports us with venue and logistics, and to uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Medical Support, a non-profit organization who helps us to process your donations and uh, buy and deliver all the supplies to Ukraine. So thank you uh, one more time for being with us today. Please donate to us, and I give the floor to Alex to introduce our today's speaker. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, yeah, we're about to get started, but let me just very quickly mention some important house rules and practicalities. So everybody is welcome to use the, the broadcast chats during the presentation for discussion, comments, questions, uh, maybe sharing some relevant papers related to the talk. And also, if you have questions for Irina after the, after the talk for the discussion time, you can use the Q&A feature. It's on the, on the right of the, of the screen. And you can also go there and upvote the questions of, of other people. Um, the organizing team is deeply committed to making this virtual conference an inclusive and safe space for everyone. So we kindly ask uh, all of you to actively help us with this. We have a code of conduct. It's available on our website. And according to it, and to keep things nice for, for all, any hate speech or harmful comments will not be tolerated. With further ado, I am very excited to introduce Professor Irina Rich. Irina is a core faculty member at Mila, the Quebec AI Institute, where most of us, the organizers, are. And she's a full professor at the University of Montreal, Canada Excellence Research Chair, TIFAR Canada AI Research AI Chair, among other titles. And I was thinking about how to summarize all the research areas and contributions of Irina. And I think it would take um, uh, all the whole, all the talk time. So let me just say that one key aspect, in my opinion, of her research is uh, her truly interdisciplinary approach. I have had the pleasure to, to read uh, some of Irina's papers and listen to, to her talks and, and panels, uh, interventions about AI and neuroscience. And it's always been a, a thought provoking and inspiring experience for me. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will be no different today. Uh, so that's why uh, I'm really excited um, to hear her talk about computational psychology and psychological computation how AI and brain sciences can help each other. Irina, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you so much for your introduction and well, thank you for inviting me. I, I really, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to participate in this uh, great initiative. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing idea that you guys came up with to have this uh, conference um, to support uh, the nations for Ukraine and hopefully the in-person conference also will be kind of even more helpful. Yeah, but uh, okay, let me share my screen second okay so can you see that my screen good. well that looks great yep. thank you okay yeah so um yeah i may need uh, some reminders from you about uh, time left before the end of the talk because i realized that I prepared way more than <laughs> one hour can um, fit, but let me just uh, give you an overview of various very exciting uh, developments in uh, on the intersection between uh, basically uh, machine learning and um, like psychology, psychiatry, which is called uh, computational psychiatry, kind of to denote the fact that. Uh, psychiatry also needs uh, more kind of modern day uh, measurements and uh, inferences based on them. And I'll talk about that later. I just give a few examples, but there are many more. And those who are interested, I, I'm happy to talk afterwards and provide more references. And psychological computation uh, meant that essentially uh, going in the opposite direction and looking at AI systems, we may want to take into account what we know about uh, human psychology, neuroscience at different levels, and uh, not always, but sometimes it might be actually quite helpful in improving AI approaches. So going back to where psychiatry is today, the interesting thing, again, it's uh, and not just me uh, saying that it seemed to be uh, quite a few people in the intersection of those fields, they keep noticing that, well, the prevalence of mental disorders is huge and kind of keeps growing, but the state of art in a sense is same as it was like hundreds of years ago. So uh, just like in Freudian times and later on and right now, what is basically diagnosis is based on, it's based on the conversation with a doctor an evaluation done again by a person listening to you and uh, trying to figure out like what are the features uh, that may indicate potential uh, issues and what to do is there but again uh, this is quite not at the technological level uh, that we are today with other areas of medicine and uh, in general and that was kind of realized as a big problem to the point that, well, in that uh, famous paper uh, by Michael Frank and his authors, uh, they basically claim that psychiatric research, psychiatric research is in crisis because uh, they describe an example of what happens when a person comes to doctor's office with, say, complain about uh, stomach pain. Usually, all kind of tests are being done, like potentially, I don't know, X-ray and so on and so forth, and the blood work. While the person comes with um, mental health problems, uh, then situation is almost like described here. Like you come with a stomach pain and doctor tells you, well, um, maybe try some uh, pain medicine. And if the pain doesn't subside, okay, so maybe try medication against reflux. So this is definitely not what's going on in any other medical area, but unfortunately it's mainly still what's going on in uh, psychiatry and psychology. And we kind of probably all know that. So what does this example kind of supposed to motivate? Basically the attempts to come up with um, objective measurements of whatever kind. So basically blood work uh, equivalent or X-ray equivalent uh, but in psychology and psychiatry. Well, of course, I mean, it's uh, probably the most complicated organ in the human body. Therefore, it's uh, no wonder it's difficult to come up with such things. But nevertheless, um, it's worth trying. 
And that basically started the whole field that uh, is called computational psychiatry. And it's been going on for, I guess, more than a decade by now. And basically the idea is um, to try to find very informative objective measurements using um, various tools, whether it's like more like classical functional MRI imaging, uh, EEG, MEG, or it is uh, beyond scanner. It's like wearable devices, text, speech, audio, video, um, whatever you can see uh, basically that reflects uh, mental states of a person and changes in those mental states. Of course, it goes way beyond uh, kind of uh, medical or clinical healthcare. It, it can be applied to multiple uh, kind of situations to uh, generally speaking, healthy people to hopefully improve their productivity, to potentially prevent accidents, which could be due to uh, like improper mental state, like, um, I don't know, losing alertness, losing focus due to being tired or so on and so forth. And various other applications, like if you can uh, measure, uh, detect, recognize mental states and their changes, there are lots of uh, useful things you can do with that, both for mental health, well, you can, well, of course, neuromarketing is probably more useful for companies who are doing the marketing, but I'm just kind of listing variety of applications that can be, uh, can be developed if we have relatively uh, accurate uh, measurements of the mental states. Irina, just one uh, one second. Sorry for interrupting. Could you click on hide uh, at this banner uh, at the bottom? That is, it's hiding a little part. Oh, of the... sorry. Oh, you you were seeing that. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Interrupting. Interrupting. Okay, no problem. Yeah, and today I'm not going to really actually talk about the more classical um, kind of measurements. Uh, that people historically use, such as EEG, functional MRI, and MEG. It's a separate talk, and all I want to say that, in general, it's like whole field showing quite a lot of success using machine learning techniques, and uh, even before the deep learning kind of um, uh, introduced to this area, so even um, especially in setting with small data sets, relatively small data sets, somewhat simpler approaches like classical SVM and logistic regression, especially sparse methods, they were quite useful. And there are many type of mental states and their features that we sometimes call statistical biomarkers uh, that could be detected and used to analyze, uh, like uh, basically discriminate between patients and controls in different conditions from uh, schizophrenia to cocaine addiction and so on and so forth. However, uh, yeah, uh, today I do not want to uh, dive, as I said, into um, the classical, uh, say, in-scanner functional MRI uh, type of based analysis or like other uh, medical grade devices that are used to measure mental states. Okay, yeah, basically, basically, I would like to go beyond scanner and I'll just give a few examples of successful application on functional MRI uh, to detect and categorize mental states. And uh, I apologize for that slide actually not showing quite right, but just uh, to make long story short, like just one example, what you can do with functional MRI, you can, uh, for example, categorize differences between uh, functional networks, between the healthy controls, and patients with cocaine addiction. And you can also investigate questions such as what kind of uh, medication or basically what kind of interferences may or may not have effect. And it was this uh, old study we did with uh, Mount Sinai, essentially based on functional MRI. For example, uh, you can test the hypothesis whether stimulant for stimulant would work. For example, if methylphenidate, well, also known as Ritalin, is given to cocaine addicts, uh, then apparently the functional networks as measured by functional MRI start looking more similar to controls. So they kind of normalized. And the way you can test that, you use machine learning approaches to uh, discriminate or classify between the controls and um, uh, people with addiction. And uh, it's 
practically impossible to discriminate when, say, they, they, they took some methylphenidate. So it's just example of kind of the applications of machine learning that can be useful in this type of settings. And another again, old story was uh, that you can actually search in the space of possible features that might be particularly discriminative, for example, of uh, schizophrenia versus control. And you may actually find something new using machine learning and multivariate analysis that was not necessarily immediately kind of obvious when people did analysis with standard uh, methods uh, kind of in the neuroscience. And particularly in this case, it was like discovery that while individual activations of uh, brain um, areas or kind of voxels uh, with response to some task is kind of the same. There is nothing discriminative between controls and uh, schizophrenia patients in that particular task. I mean, um, nevertheless, if you look at the differences in network kind of topology, and that was like functional network, the network as measured uh, through the brain activity in fMRI, and uh, essentially it's a network based on the pairwise correlations across areas. So that network was very different and it was very telling feature. So that was an example where with machine learning and feature extraction, you can try to come up with better biomarkers of certain disorder. But as I mentioned, I didn't want to dwell on uh, functional MRI today. Uh, it's like a huge field and uh, there are pluses and minuses and uh, it's quite noisy measurements as well. Plus you not gonna um, so easily test every patient or if it's not even patient, but uh, just the person who kind of wants to get some help or basically like track their mental states, you're not gonna put them in, not even an MRI scanner, but even putting EEG or any kind of other uh, medical grade devices on them in real life is uh, definitely out of question. So the next question was, um, can we, how much information about person mental state is out there in much cheaper kind of beyond scanner uh, measurements? Well, wearables, of course, uh, whether it's wearable EG or uh, devices that measures, for example, your uh, well, changes in blood pressure and heart rate, um, well, changes the skin conductance, because we all know that uh, skin conductance changes when uh, the person uh, basically the skin gets a bit more wet, which is usually very clear indication of stress uh, increase and so on. But even simpler than that, uh, without any gadgets, what can we tell about mental states from such everyday things as speech or even just transcribed text? And that was a motivation that started like lots of research in the uh, computational psychiatry group that I was part of when I was still back at uh, IBM research and uh, that uh, whole line of research is continuing. There is a bunch of papers uh, on that. Uh, I kind of uh, participated in some of those projects and I just wanted to give you an overview of what surprisingly might be possible with text and well, speech analysis. Uh, just to give a few examples of mental states that are actually discoverable uh, from this type of um, this type of measurements well in a sense it's nothing surprising because uh, we all know that language is a window into the brain uh, the famous quote uh, it's actually indeed is and sometimes it's even scary just how much you can infer about person mental state if you just uh, carefully listen to what they're saying and in a sense, it shouldn't be surprising either because that's what the whole profession of a therapist is based on, right? It's just not yet being automated, but subconsciously uh, doctors kind of elicit those features, uh, just uh, they do it without the use of computer. And as I mentioned, this work uh, is um, it's continued to be led now by Guillermo Cecchi, my close colleague and uh, like former um, uh, collaborator from IBM research, well, also kind of current collaborator on some other projects. And uh, if you're interested, uh, his webpage contains many more 
uh, recent papers on this topic because speech and text is kind of the uh, bread and butter of that group. So what can you do? I mean, what can you do with uh, speech and text analysis? There are multiple examples. I'll give just a few, but basically you can do diagnosis and prognosis. Basically, you can try to predict if someone will likely develop um, certain kind of uh, mental undesirable mental state. I'll give one example. And that relates, for example, to psychosis. Prodromal psychosis is exactly prodromal means that the person without psychotic episodes yet uh, going through interviews uh, may be kind of ranked as a person at more risk or less risk depending on, well, actually their speech. You can also predict drug intake. I'll give an example. And there is a long list of other kind of either psychiatric or uh, neurological disorders, for example, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, also suicidality, chronic pain, the list goes on. And also going beyond diagnosis and prognosis, I'll give again somewhat right now old example of what can be done in terms of developing uh, dialogue systems for therapy. And I'll kind of invite everyone interested to talk to me later on because it would be great to build upon those projects and actually hopefully do something now with large scale um, language models that keep uh, appearing out there as mushrooms after the rain, after the GPT-3 was created. So there is lots of exciting new stuff that can be done on top of that. So yeah, simple question. Can you have automated detection of mental state using speech or even transcribed speech? And why? Again, we are not replacing people or therapists or psychiatrists uh, doing diagnosis, but it can help them. It can validate uh, their diagnosis. And it also potentially can create a whole kind of new generation of this uh, personal assistance that, again, may not replace a human, but they may serve as an intermediate kind of agent between you and um, maybe your doctor or simply kind of your rest of social network. I'll talk about that later, uh, but let's start with one example. The classical example, the kind of one of the toughest uh, psychiatric kind of disorders and also the most uh, kind of difficult to characterize in general, it's a whole kind of spectrum in a sense, uh, but there are some very clear um, kind of features um, of at least well symptoms of uh, at least already developed schizophrenia, not yet prodromal, not prodromal. So basically, the disorganization of thought is one of the things that usually the doctor is kind of detecting when uh, having interview with a patient, and it's in a sense also things they are looking for like. Clearly, hallucinations are like a telltale the thing. Uh, but there are other things like poverty of speech, like short sentences, maybe um, lack of some like elaborate longer sentences with some connecting words, so on and so forth. Yeah, so it also characterized by like, well, there is also mania, which is a different thing from schizophrenia, but it sometimes may overlap in symptoms. But OK, so they uh, classical uh, kind of features is uh, speaking fast, like speech pressure and flight of ideas, like the thought kind of jumps from one idea to another very quickly and the mood can be overly excitable or irritable. Here is one example. Say you are a therapist and you've heard, or maybe transcribed the three pieces of text from uh, three different patients. And the question is, by looking at that, can you tell a person who is a uh, healthy control from the person who say has schizophrenia and another person uh, ha um, has uh, mania or is in manic stage right now if it's uh, manic depressive? Just by looking at this text. And uh, just a little bit of background, that was an experiment where patients were asked to describe their recent dream. 
Anyway, to make a long story short, since it's not a very interactive uh, kind of presentation, I can tell you who is who. The white, the first one, is control. As you could guess, the second one is in a manic episode. It is spoke much faster, and also it was a little bit less coherent, but I'm giving away some important features. And the last one is a bit of poverty of speech, disconnected thoughts, and definitely looking a bit weird uh, text of the person uh, with schizophrenia. Again, it's overly simplified, but again, just to make an example, there was this uh, paper and there is lots of follow-up work on that, but I just wanted to make it simple so, yeah, people will get it. Again, I apologize for slides not showing fully properly, but that's okay. Essentially, you can build a simple thing such as speech graph. You can use words to represent, well, basically notes to represent words, and uh, you basically use a directed links to uh, show which word followed which one and here was this sentence about i walked into a place found my grandma hugged her strongly and i woke up if you look at the graphs speech graphs of these three different patients and of course uh, i mean many more were evaluated but you see immediate uh, kind of immediate patterns you see that in many, you have many more nodes, and uh, essentially it's kind of a past speech with multiple loops going back to the same node. In that case, it was, I think, I. While schizophrenia is uh, on the opposite, much more like poor speech, it's a um, uh, smaller graph, a smaller number of nodes, it's disconnected, so on and so forth. So you can use a basic graph analysis and actually you could get uh, quite accurate results just with graph analysis. But in general, I mean, it's not just graphs. You may want to extract various other features uh, because, uh, first of all, we know a lot about, as I mentioned, um, what usually uh, kind of doctor looks for, like what type of features are usually associated with schizophrenia. For example, coherence of speech might be something to look into, but your job as machine learning kind of uh, researcher is to figure out how you're going to formalize those kind of common sense uh, intuitive features into measurements from your data. And the usual, of course, classification methodology, just like basic machine learning. So you would train on the text using feature extractor, and that's where the most interesting part lies, after which you can hopefully use whatever classification approach uh, to um discriminate between say controls and people with disorder and the interesting thing about those graphs that i mentioned and some other features as well they are quite informative for example this classification between um kind of schizophrenia and mania was say for example up to 93 percent accuracy and that was just based say on speech graphs and it was more accurate than using uh, the classical standard uh, psychometric scales. So that was interesting. But then the next kind of study was to see whether you can do this type of classification ahead of time. And that I think was, again, it's by now somewhat like um, old classical work on top of which many more recent things were built. It was quite surprising and uh, I'd say mind boggling that you can't predict one or two years ahead of time just from the uh, transcribed text of uh, interviews with um, basically troubled teens. Troubled in a sense, in this case, they were seeing psychiatrists um, because uh, they had, they didn't have psychosis yet, but they were kind of at risk of developing schizophrenia. And those interviews uh, essentially were analyzed and later on, since there were longitudinal data about what happened to them, some of them did unfortunately develop uh, psychotic episodes later. So the question was, can, could we predict from this longitudinal data who would develop psychotic episode and who will not? So 
I mean, the stand-up again, so I don't need to explain it to machine learning people, but basically the stand-up pipeline was to try to figure out features and uh, well, many things were tried, but I'm just showing what was the most winning kind of set at the end. The bottom line was that phrase lengths that in uh, uh, kind of full-blown schizophrenia may be uh, shorter than normal. Frequency of using uh, determiners like which that, again, as you remember from that example I showed you, sentences are very short, abrupt. Uh, there is nothing uh, more sophisticated than them. And very important feature was coherence. And the question was like, how do you formalize coherence here? Very simply, again, what I'm showing you is application of quite simple methods without going into anything very complicated such as uh, deep networks yet. And nevertheless, already kind of being able to extract uh, quite useful information. Bottom line, you could simply represent words as vectors in some semantic space using anything word to vec or just simple LSA approach like SVD. And then you can essentially summarize phrases or uh, sentences by averaging those vectors. And you can simply look at the angle between those vectors and see uh, and call it coherence. As trivial as that, it's actually so here is like a sentence. You uh, basically the, here is a paragraph. You split it into sentences. You use LSA in this case, not even work to vec to get the vectors for sentences, measure angles. Here you go, here is your feature vector. So you feed it into various classifiers as usual and see whether this and other features together are predictive. So anyway, here is a result, which at that point I think was quite surprising, but later studies kept kind of uh, supporting that maybe Kind of not exactly the same classifier with the same coefficients, but similar type of um, kind of classifiers, but with that set of features is quite informative about the fact whether the person uh, may develop, is at higher risk of developing psychosis than another person. What you see here uh, after trying a bunch of various approaches, actually convex hull classifier uh, helped the most. And it showed quite clearly that all the subjects, all the patients who didn't end up developing psychotic episode in that feature space happened to be within that convex hull, while those who did, and they're like, it's, it's a relatively small study, but it's just to show you an example. Those who did, they all happened to be outside of the convex hull, which led us to a joke kind of quoting, um, from Anna Karenina that uh, all happy families are somewhat similar while all unhappy ones are unhappy in their own ways, but they're outside of the convex hull. In any case, it's just an illustration, one illustration. While there are many others, it was kind of a um, joke we used to make, which was actually actual data from one of the a YouTube influencers who was sometimes uh, recording um, kind of uh, episodes about makeup and so on, and sometimes on purpose drinking in front of the screen, she was saying that I'll teach you how to apply makeup when you're drunk. And it's a useful skill. And then she kept talking and just for fun, we kind of transcribed the text of that YouTube video and just measured her coherence and basically phrase to phrase and uh, alternate phrase coherence are two axes in the graph on the left. And it was quite discriminative about when she was sober and when she was not. So just, yeah, it was just a fun example that it's not necessarily something spe specific, specific about schizophrenia. It could be used in other contexts. Just to give you more ideas, and I think I need to speed up because uh, there are several other parts of the story. I just wanted to say that it's not schizophrenia alone, but the whole range of other uh, mental uh, disorders and conditions that can benefit from uh, this type of more like automated diagnosis and extracting various features. It was another experiment. Um, users were uh, there. Yeah, so basically, 
yeah, there were MDMA users or ecstasy, and uh, they were given, uh, there are several conditions. I mean, some people were given placebo, some were given different doses of MDMA. Uh, and I remember getting all kind of questions like, how can we sign up to be uh, subjects in this uh, study? But <laughs> nevertheless, um, Bottom line, you can measure uh, proximity of the transcribed speech vectors to the vectors corresponding to concepts of empathy, compassion, and so on and so forth. And as probably you can guess, there will be some difference before, like without and with MDMA. And indeed, uh, it was possible quite accurately to classify, to discriminate, um, uh, people in the study who were on under the influence of the particular drug versus those who were not, just based on the proximity of their speech in the vector space to the particular concepts that are known to be like telltales of the mental states induced by those substances. There is much more, but I probably should start skipping things, not just the speech uh, transcribed, not just the text, but combination of text and speech can be even much more accurate predictor of various conditions. And uh, yeah, in that case, it was uh, cocaine users versus controls. Yeah, there are multiple studies. If you're interested, I can, as I said, I can refer you to the literature. There were also studies about uh, diagnosing more like neuro, um, not necessarily psychiatric, but uh, uh, neurological disorders, for example, Parkinson disease, and uh, also a bunch of experiments that are based on um, kind of text output, open-ended interview, for example, if they talk about typical day in your life, they talk about that. And then you can also, you can take a look at the graphs, you can take a look at other features. Bottom line, I just very quickly going through this, trying to tell you that uh, extracting some meaningful features that uh, perhaps uh, the intuition for those is taking from what um, say doctors know about the disorder, plus also just trying out various uh, kind of feature extractors, keeps helping to come up with quite discriminative, uh, even like simple classifiers, that can uh, tell you about the differences in these mental states. And again, if, as you can notice, the classifiers themselves could be quite simple because the core focus here is the features uh, being informative. And uh, last but not least, there was another study. I mean, there are multiple, of course, but it's just an example when uh, basically the text, uh, the poems of different authors of different poets was considered and uh, it was known that certain, some of them unfortunately committed suicide uh, like a year later or like within like a year two uh, time frame. And the analysis of that text uh, was also quite telling in a sense that you could detect uh, whether the person was at higher risk of um, kind of uh, committing suicide than not. So, there is much more, as I said, if anyone interested, uh, I can provide references on where to look, but you can, first of all, definitely look at the computational psychiatry page uh, of my colleagues at IBM. But what I wanted to also uh, talk a little bit is not just that passive uh, analysis based on uh, extracting features and trying to tailor features to different disorders, and then trying to improve your diagnosis and prognosis, but actually more like active interactive dialogue type of um, systems that can serve various purposes. And the reason for those is uh, like, I mean, it's nothing new to say that, but uh, for example, yeah, depression is quite widespread, unfortunately mental condition, uh, pandemic di didn't help to put it mildly, and even before pandemic, it was estimated that it could be by 2030, the amount of worldwide disability and life loss attributable to depression may become greater than for any other condition, including cancer, stroke, heart disease, accidents, and war. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not my estimate. It was a prediction by World Health Organization. Uh, whether it's correct or not exactly, I think the message is clear that, yeah, depression is a big issue. And what's worse, even if you live in not in some rural areas where it's really hard to get medical help, uh, even if you live in the city with many doctors, everybody knows how difficult it is to actually find a good doctor, uh, get appointments. And even if you do, no doctor can possibly track your mental state sufficiently frequently on as needed basis. And the only thing that comes to mind in such situation is some form of technological help that can possibly track those measurements and perhaps provide the first line kind of help between possibly you and your doctor or even friends and family if the system may detect uh, via dialogue that it's probably worth alerting your friends and family and doctors because maybe you need help. There are many other kind of scenarios where such system can be useful, but the challenge is um, there are many attempts, but none of those systems is yet sufficiently um, high quality to be, um, I mean, really, really useful. But as I said, I mean, it's a booming area, uh, I guess, as many startups trying to do something. So in this part, yeah. Just, yeah. just ahead of that there's uh, 15 more minutes or so. Uh, if you, you want to allow some time for discussion, there's already quite. OK, uh, yeah, I'll try to go quickly. I'll just give you the brief idea without describing the uh, technical details, how it was done. But OK, so what I want to actually highlight is with all this type of uh, systems, as we know from more recent, like uh, large language models and not just language, but uh, any kind of large multimodal models. Their bottleneck is data. So this type of applications are usually um, data poor. So we were able to find, for example, publicly available data set of therapy sessions, transcribed therapy sessions, but it only, yeah, it only had like 400 therapy sessions and essentially it was uh, just like 42,000 patient therapist response pairs. You cannot possibly train GPT-3 or any of those systems on such a small amount of data. And uh, as I will show, even before GPT-3, even like um, smaller deep net based dialogue systems, of course, could not learn well from such small data sets. So at that point, we had to basically go and develop another way of representation learning uh, using uh, basically hash code ba based model. But what I'm trying to say that that's okay now because with existing pre-trained on internet large language models one can possibly use this uh, as a fine-tuning data set or even parts of that could be used as a prompt and i think there is lots of interesting research questions and practical applications that can be done on top of existing large language models when combined with relatively small limited but very informative uh, kind of medical data sets in therapy. And uh, I kind of just really uh, wanted to invite people to look into that problem. And if you would like to work on that, yeah, you can reach out to me because literally, uh, I, I think it's now finally a good time where all this small data problem can be circumvented by the fact that we already have large scale pre-trained systems that have good uh, model of language in general. Anyway, in this particular study, uh, some of you probably have seen it a few times before, but uh, just for those who didn't, uh, they're like typical dialogues between patient, usually saying a lot, and therapist um, basically giving a short remark that somewhat aligns with what person is saying and trying to steer the conversation um, in the Kind of direction that the patient was going on. So it says essentially there are many other uh, modes of dialogue, and there is a whole like books on uh, psychiatric dialogue that could be used perhaps to uh, formalize some metrics of like what's good or bad about uh, certain di dialogue trajectories. But in that work, we just kind of try to 
uh, do a simple thing and say, let's try to model uh, one mode where the goal of the therapist is simply to be supportive, aligned with what person's saying and simply just help them going in that direction. And there's a proxy for being aligned uh, with what patient is saying. We kind of just used mutual information between the content of the patient's um, uh, whatever paragraph and the response of the therapist. And the idea was basically try to build a model uh, with a relatively small number of parameters. Uh, so in this case, it was like hash code based so that it can find representations um, where the patient and therapist uh, are more aligned in that sense, and then use it to later on generate actual textual response of the therapist. What I want to say basically that the lesson from that study was that when compared to, of course, generic deep net systems at that time, like basic LSTM, or a few others that didn't aim at this particular type of diagnosis and were not quite prepared to deal with small data. Of course, they didn't do so well in terms of uh, being either relative in terms of their responses or diverse or anything. And the uh, kind of plot here is just showing that the systems on the right, three versions of those were much be better in terms of being appropriate and diverse. And the examples would be simply something like patient saying something about losing three pounds. Uh, the deep net, again, it's maybe not a fair comparison. It wasn't specifically designed for this type of uh, dialogue purposes. It simply outputs nonsense. Uh, and the different versions of the therapy system in our case uh, was kind of more reasonable and some versions were kind of actually making, definitely making sense and seem, seem to be a kind of um, something that you would definitely prefer to the alternatives. And there are many other examples and uh, sometimes unexpectedly funny when the person was complaining about difficulties of getting, uh, difficulties of get, get, getting uh, therapy and so on while the system replied, oh yeah, you never tried lithium. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't kind of supposed to be funny, but it turned out to be like, okay, forget about therapy, try some meds. But again, you can see that the uh, non-specifically designed for the purpose uh, deep network dialogue system was outputting complete nonsense and so on and so forth. Anyway, as I already mentioned, and I'll probably skip through that, it's just a long-term higher level vision of what could we possibly achieve if we would uh, be collecting not just the text and speech information but potentially uh, all these variable devices can be combined in the picture if people kind of use them on a daily basis and the basic uh, bodily measurements of the skin conductance and heart rate um, can be also quite telling um, about well, as I said, stress is clearly changing the skin conductance immediately. So you could imagine, and again, that's more of an idea <laughs> that I guess various startups are trying to um, kind of realize, but it's still it, it, it's still a kind of um, uh, open problem how to create a good system like that, uh, where you would have your personal well, guardian angel tracking your mental states through all these measurements, perhaps engaging in the dialogue when it's relatively clear that it can help, or if it's not sure, but it kind of detects certain changes that it deems um, troublesome, it could alert uh, people. So basically not replacing a person, but serving as a, a intermediary between you and your social network <laughs> or your doctor. And uh, I still wanted to very quickly get into yet another topic, or actually two, but I already said that uh, there are multiple things you can do further, but I think one uh, really useful thing would be to try and uh, build such systems on top of the powerful large language models versus GPT and or K or many others. 
I just kind of wanted to note um, that there is a clear connection between how to uh, how to build dialogue systems that are kind of aware of person mental states and are trying to achieve certain uh, goals of the dialogue. And this whole uh, area of AI safety and particularly alignment with human values when the system produces their output. And I only kind of show what the problem could be. I'm not going to talk about solutions right now, especially since we have five minutes left. But there is a clear link between these attempts to take into account how to properly uh, drive therapeutic dialogue and what to take into account about your trajectory and your kind of um, patient trajectory and how you would like systems to behave. So perhaps there is an uh, interesting avenue for research on the intersection of these two fields. And just to give you an example, uh, well, what we mean by alignment, I mean, it's it's still not 100% well-defined world, but basically you want to avoid undesirable, undesirable behaviors of the system. You don't want system to say something that um, people in general would not consider appropriate. For example, uh, like last uh, spring during the scaling, neural scaling class, uh, a couple of students did an interesting uh, project and uh, kind of continue to work on that right now. It's a publicly available interface at Hugging Face. You can just go there and uh, try this system called Magma, which is a multi one of the multimodal systems out there. Uh, you can provide image, text, and the system will output text. And what we observed is not always, but sometimes system would do something like that. You show this picture of old lady crossing the road and say, do I help her? And the system replies, no, she's burdened to society. Or you show another type of a picture and say, is flipping off someone appropriate? And the system says, well, it depends on the situation. If you're flipping someone who is being aggressive or rude, it's not appropriate. But if you're flipping off someone who is nice, it's fine. Not exactly probably aligned with intention of a person who designed the system and uh, most of the people who probably would kind of get that response. So on and so forth, you ask about like, is this graffiti inappropriate and system? No, I don't think so. I think it's a great example of graffiti that's part of city's history. Anyway, so examples go on, go on and go on. And that's where you can try future learning, fine tuning. That's what kind of people try there, trying to provide better examples. But what I'm getting at with, so they were basically providing the well-labeled examples. And now we're trying to work on the interface with Discord where uh, you don't have to collect those examples um, by like human, uh, like a mechanical torque. You just like let people talk to the system and ex examples will be collected hopefully automatically. And yes, it will improve their results. But what I'm trying to say that perhaps ideas and uh, intuitions from how to properly lead, say, therapeutic dialogue can definitely be used in such context and could improve uh, any of those uh, language or multimodal models. Since I don't have much time, I guess I'm probably just going to skip the last topic. And it was more on uh, in the category of how uh, psychiatry and psychology can help improve machine learning. And maybe I'll just spend literally two minutes to give you the gist of that. You can always find this work online. But the idea was like whether we can improve reinforcement learning using further intuitions or knowledge from say psychiatry and bottom line is the decision making uh, and actions are affected by uh, different mental conditions such as Parkinson, Alzheimer, addiction and so on. So there is this whole spectrum and from point of view of evolutionary psychiatry, uh, all these different uh, biases in decision making and reward processing uh, could be there for reason, for example, in depression you do put more weight on negative reward, but if the life environment was such that, that that was kind of important for survival, maybe it's not such a totally irrelevant uh, type of uh, bias. 
all I want to say without going into like uh, <laughs> neuroscience and psychology of reward processing, there are two pathways, kind of positive and negative. And when we kind of incorporated those two streams into the reinforcement learning uh, at different levels of reinforcement learning from simplistic multi-arm bandits uh, to contextual bandits and to the full reinforcement learning, I mean, the paper is out there. Bottom line, I mean, you can modify multi-arm bandit algorithms like Thompson sampling with two streams, positive, negative reward. You can do it also with um, contextual bandits. And bottom line, that split in two streams like um, methods, also with Q-learning, they do outperform uh, various baselines because they seem to be more flexible. And then you can have fun observing agents with different biases playing like Pac-Man game and you see some types of behavior like that. So basically, it's just an example that uh, those intuitions and uh, knowledge can be used to make, uh, say, reinforcement learning algorithms more flexible and that can pay off in certain situations. But I think I better stop here because I think we're at the end of the hour and just conclude as usual that the intersection between AI and neuroscience is very exciting and can be quite useful for both fields. Thank you very much. That was that was very interesting. A lot of uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a great review of of topics uh, in these fields and a lot of ideas. Uh, Irina, do you have, uh, even though we are at the hour, do you have a, a few minutes for, for questions? Yeah, definitely. Uh, should I stop sharing the screen, I guess? Yeah, oh, we've moved it out from the stage, so yeah. Uh, OK, let me then take some questions from the audience first. Uh, there is one from uh, Alexi. He wrote, in the context of predicting um, person's mental state from speech, how much transfer we can get through retraining these models on other domains. Transfer learning with this kind of data and tasks. He wrote, I can imagine collecting in-domain data is very challenging for this domain. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a good question. Uh, I think that's exactly what I would love to try because yes, data sets are limited like this example. Uh, it was a rare publicly available one and it was relatively small. There are, of course, many data sets, but they are more like, uh, since they're medical, say some of my colleagues have all these data sets, but they are not publicly available and so on and so forth. So uh, it's bottom line hard to probably uh, pre-train from scratch just on such data. So the hope is that if the model is pre-trained on large amount of diverse text, I mean, we hope that there might be a transfer or you fine tune them on particular speech, so on particular text. But that's exactly in a sense what I said would be interesting to explore because sometimes you may see transfer, um, but perhaps not always. And understanding when large language models will be useful in this context or anything needs to be changed. Uh, can you just use them as is with uh, parts of the dialogue as prompts or you really need to fine tune them seriously. Uh, that's all to be explored. It's basically, that's kind of call for projects. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Nika. Uh, and it is, uh, how do we know uh, if it is the prevalence of mental disorders uh, or their uh, diagnosis that has grown? Uh, both. Well, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, yeah, I don't think we will ever know anything for sure because the whole whole uh, diagnosis of mental disorders is not an uh, exact science. And uh, <laughs> among people in computational psychiatry, there was all, always this joke that what's being used for diagnosis, uh, that's um, basically the... Uh, the statistical manual, so diagnostic and statistical manual or DSM-4, DSM-5. And then the joke was that if you look inside of it, there is not much statistics there, actually none. So it's a little bit of uh, hand wavy in certain cases and disorders being characterized based on symptoms. And it's not even totally clear 
whether, I mean, some of them are just uh, in a sense made up, but I mean, there are clear cases, say it's some clinical depression. Uh, there are clear physical aspects of that. I mean, uh, the level of energy, weight changes and so, so there are like, uh, on the extremes, it becomes more certain in terms of diagnosis. Uh, in between, yeah, I agree that, I mean, the amount of diagnosis of ADHD just to get stimulants has grown in the past years and so on. But uh, yeah, it's a good question. So unfortunately, as I said, the psychiatry and psychology is much less of a, definitely not exact science and even much less exact than other medical domains. Well, that's why <laughs> at least some attempts to make it a little bit standing on more solid ground. Thank yeah, you. but based on self-reports, I think that especially in the last couple of years, many people would agree that it's not just the amount of diagnosis of depression that increased. Uh, you have mentioned several times during your talk that one of the main bottlenecks for the application of uh, machine learning to computational psychiatry is the, the lack of, of data, clinical data, and so on, for example, for the for the therapy and diagnosis from, from, from speech. And related to this, Alexi wrote that uh, he imagines that Facebook and co uh, have access to a much broader set of data about their customers than, than doctors and what is publicly available. So yeah, do you have any ideas about this uh, uh, facts or paradox, potential paradox, uh, how that could be leveraged? To, to research maybe? Well, I mean, that's definitely very, very interesting and large data, but I don't think that Facebook will uh, kind of just share them. I, I, I don't know. I mean, basically the question is like, if we can just um, try to get the data, publicly available data on Facebook from multiple conversations. But then, yeah, I mean, that would be all great, just like people collect data from Twitter and so on. Uh, but yeah, it requires some work to create those data sets. Just like uh, the classical example of uh, large scale 5 billion uh, image text pairs, uh, Lion 5B data set, it took some work. It took like a year or so to create the data set, but then uh, it became like the basis for training uh, like the state of art, the open clip, which outperforms original clip. Now that's what the uh, lion just kind of trade. They actually have paper at New Reeves and um, benchmarks kind of in data sets track. And then the famous stable diffusion was trained on that. So basically creating such data sets that are publicly available uh, is a lot of work, but it's extremely valuable. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that Facebook and Twitter and other social networks have lots and lots of um, very interesting data. But uh, the question is like how exactly to put them together, make them available so you can actually use them for training, fine tuning, prompting and so on and so forth. And just all kind of analysis you can apply to the text. Yeah, yeah I agree. Actually, uh, the first talk of uh, Help Ukraine, Timmy Gebru made a very strong claim about how there should be more research uh, about creating good quality data sets. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I really kind of, I know it's kind of a trivial thing that was repeated by many people, but I really started shifting towards that view that what really matters, I think these days is quality and quantity of data, because look at what's being achieved with, uh, in terms of state of art in like text uh, or multimodal, uh, multimodal systems. Yeah, transformers with some variations of architecture, but it's and, and training algorithms again the difference the delta is not the training algorithm it's not the architecture it's fairly generic it's the data you train on and then you have various works like say Shinshila paper that uh, was looking at the scaling laws of the original Jared Kaplan's uh, uh, neural scaling laws for uh, GPT-3 and realized that say it's more important to invest in your compute into training on larger and more diverse data with maybe smaller model and the results will be better. And then a paper from Stanford by Surya Ganguly and collaborators saying that if you 
really invest in the process of selecting samples you train on from your data set, you kind of rank their usefulness and this and that, then your scaling improvement of your performance with respect to the amount of data you see will go down not as a power law, but much, much faster, like exponential, so on and so forth. So it's all pointing this direction that creating good data sets, like large, but also diverse, rich, and having whatever properties you may think you would like to define, that's, that's kind of the, uh, probably the most important thing to improve the perform and performance of the models right now. Again, I, I, I might be getting a bit biased, but I mean, there seems to be like a repeating theme about that. And now I, I can see that too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, one more question from the audience. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI and hypotherapy? Uh, uh, hypnotherapy, thank you, Alex. Hypotherapy. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's quite a generic question. I mean, in general, just hypnotherapy with a person, um, I do consider it, I, I know that it can be quite uh, useful uh, and it's more like at that extreme of like, if you have a, a quite persuasive speaker um, and I think hypnotherapy is like extreme and of being persuasive. You really affect the person's mental state and uh, it's done properly. I think it can be very useful and very powerful. The question is like, to what extent? Yeah, I don't know, because uh, I think what's at play there is all kind of signals that the therapist communicates and they are also nonverbal. And um, it might be really hard to replicate it in AI at this point. However, perhaps just if, if it's just by the content, um, I don't know. I mean, there are diff different ways of thinking how AI can intersect with that. And of course, the simplest thing is even if you turn on your YouTube and listen to somebody's uh, kind of a hypnotherapy session with music and certain text and so on and so forth. I mean, that could be sometimes uh, somewhat effective. So AI could help maybe by just turning on appropriate snippets at appropriate moments, at least like detecting and uh, then switching to the human produced content. Mm -hmm. But I'm totally like thinking aloud here. Yeah, but I don't think that AI is at the point yet when it can successfully hypnotherapy a person. Again, I might be wrong. Yeah, people seem to be completely hypnotized by Twitter, right? <laughs> true. Yeah. True. I think I think AI is already uh, hypnotizing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, and uh, yeah, so it might be not in the direction they want. So if it's hypnotizing them anyway, we might actually think about how to make it useful. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Just uh, one last question uh, from me. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder about the kind of uh, social impact of the systems, especially of the systems which can make a diagnosis just based on text or just daily performance of, of a human. Because, you know, like diagnosis, it's something very personal and something which person would not like to uh, others to know probably. And if it can be detected just from, I don't know, someone's tweets, uh, it uh, it can be yeah. dangerous. And I wonder how how we can like uh, prevent misuse of these systems. Yeah. Well, I mean, legally, whatever you conclude from that, I mean, you cannot use practically. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just like uh, for your information. If it's your device and it's your app and it's basically your information and you want some feedback, like you want to basically have some mirror of your mental state, but it indeed it stays on your app. Uh, I think that's fine. Uh, although another question will be to what extent uh, you should be relying on that and really believing that, or it's more like a additional piece of evidence or like whatever, but 
uh, since, as you said, pretty much it can be done externally. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Like when we were talking about those uh, results back at IBM during some meeting, our manager suddenly stopped talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah. I know it's 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 a good question, but uh, on the other hand, I don't know. But how do we know that people, for example, trying targeted advertisement are not already doing that in some other form? Uh, that's so true, true. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. My my take on that was more of a. It's like your personal. Some kind of personal helper, personal, I don't know, guardian angel, basically extension of yourself, because uh, sometimes you really need a, you need a mirror. And that's kind of the role of therapist is often just basically to provide you a mirror. They don't really do anything to you. They just let you look in the mirror. But maybe that could be kind of an intermediate mirror before you're waiting another month for your appointment. Yeah, yeah, and more accessible than than uh, therapists at this, than it is currently. Okay, so maybe on this note, uh, we can wrap it up. We're 50 minutes over. Thank you so much for for staying a bit longer for the discussion. I think it was very very interesting. So a virtual applause from from us and and the whole audience. And uh, yeah, with this uh, we we close the session uh remind everybody that uh, you know you can help us with your donation and also by by sharing uh, um, the information about the conference with your friends and colleagues and yeah we continue uh, later this week with more talks and, and for the rest of the month so yeah well, thank, you so much. thank you thank you so yeah, much and uh, yeah we'll definitely uh, spread the word more frequently and uh, to a wider network thanks a lot thank you bye bye everyone bye bye, bye. thank you somebody was raising a hand uh, uh yeah. yes